We've got in here one of the 64 hand-wired reissued Deluxe Reverbs everyone's always asking me about. And the owner says overall he loves it, but it squeals if you, you know, it feeds back if you turn the reverb up too high. That will either be the tank or the uh, cathode bypass cap on V4, we will get there. Uh, with the amp on, all the volumes at zero and, and the reverb at zero, there's quite a bit of hiss. This thing should be almost silent, so this, it may be a preamp tube, uh, but we'll check that out. Let's check out the volume pots. Normal channel, nothing. I suspect he may not have a tube in that channel in V1. A little bit of crackle, a little bit of a occasional pop. Make sure we don't have DC on the grid of V2B. It's like there's an intermittent connection there. And the reverb? Yeah, that should not be happening with no signal. Let's try a different tank real fast. All right, you can't see it, but I've got a Mojo Tone tank hooked up in the back. It's a pretty good hum but no feedback. So we're, we're gonna take this out and we're gonna check this problem out with the crackle and pops on the volume and see if we can get rid of the hum in the reverb and take open, you know, open up his stock tank and see if it's fixable or worth fixing. If it's one of the uh, Beltons that they use, better to put in a better quality tank, but uh, shouldn't be anything too bit bad, but for the price these things cost, you shouldn't have any of these issues. Um, subjectively, actually pretty objectively, I think uh, your money's better spent on getting a early 70s Silverface Deluxe Reverb for the same price, getting it brought back into fighting shape, you're going to get a higher quality thing. But uh, let's see what we can do to make this thing good. Alright, this is the reverb tank that came with the amp. It's a Ruby, which is usually a pretty good tank. It's better than the Beltons that they're using on the uh, 65 and 68. but it this one was never assembled from the factory properly and was wedged over here and this spring has messed up as a result. I'm going to put it back in place and see if that fixed it, though uh, it should never have happened. If, it did, if that did not fix the feedback from just being mechanically coupled, then we'll just change out the tank. It's not, they're not uh, worth spending money on to repair. They're not high quality things. And a new one that works is about 30 bucks. So let's see how this does. Power it on. Wait till we hear that wonderful white noise with the volumes at zero. All right, let's bring the reverb up now. No more feedback. Let's get a guitar in there and make sure everything's working. <laughs> tank still feeds back at the highest setting, so we put in the Mojo Tone test tank and we'll compare that. All right, so that one feeds back at the highest setting as well, which tells me that both the uh, stock tank has one issue, which we've alleviated by ending that mechanical coupling but there's probably a problem with that uh, cathode bypass cap on V4. Speaking of which, you can see V5 is pulled, so he's not using the tremolo, and V1 is pulled, so he's not using the normal channel. That's fine. So there's less things to go wrong, but uh, that white noise could be V1 or V4. Let's take this out of standby with the reverb off and try some different preamp tubes, see if that white noise goes away. 
Still there with V1 pulled, with V2 rather. Silent with V4 pulled. So if V4 uh, has that cathode bypass cap uh, that's not performing correctly, you will have feedback from the reverb, but you could also have an artificially high noise floor if that tube is not biasing correctly. So we're not gonna throw any more tubes in there until we see what's going on with its cathode. So it's time to pull the chassis from the cabinet. Before we get into the inside, let's take a look under the doghouse and look out here. The uh, chassis was stuck to the foil on the underside of the cabinet. Very common in the 65 and 68 as well because they assemble it, they put it all together before the adhesive on the aluminum foil has cured. So I had to use a cake knife to get through that thin little gap and push the foil up so we didn't get much of this tear out. We got some because I was not the first person in here. Uh, it's really aggravating that they use the cheapest aluminum foil possible and they leave it sticky. And it's also aggravating to me that I've got to then go get some acetone or uh, naphtha on this and clean off my cake knife. Power Transformers got this big shield for no real reason, and it gets dented and bent, and it's stupid and does nothing. This little bit of cheap stamped steel will not block a single magnetic field from this transformer. And, uh, you know, they do all this stuff, and they're going to say it's for hum, but the amp is noisy at idle with the volumes off. So where's the hum prevention? All right, let's make sure that the uh, transformers are tight. The choke seems okay. get that to line up. That one was a little bit loose. Output transformer. A little bit loose. That one's tight. And I will do the uh, power transformer hardware check from the other side. Let's get this doghouse cover off. One of those you have to slide it and doesn't want to slide because of the grommet thing over here. All right, so this has got some F and T's. That's nice to see. So it's got 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. Uh, some one watt uh, metal oxides. That all looks pretty good, actually. I'm not, I don't have any complaints about that. Um, they've divided the uh, grounds into the reservoir ground here and the preamp grounds, which is, takes care of the phase inverter and the two preamp nodes. So all this is done very comparably to what you'd find in an actual 64, 65 Deluxe Reverb. So that, that part's good. We can leave that alone, and I'll screw this back in before I flip it over. I doubt that we have a problem with one of these caps. It's possible, but it, it's unlikely. And I'm glad to see that they're using F and T's in these. All right, let's just go through this section by section. So the AC comes in. It's got this smoothing cap. It's got this uh, uh, varistor across it. Totally unnecessary, does no harm really, except it's one more thing to fail. The old ones didn't have it. This amp fairly arguably does not need it, whatever. Um, here, there is an HT fuse, an inline fuse off the rectifier tube. There's also an inline fuse here, 6.3 amp, on the heaters. These are there in case you have an HT short or a heater short. Well, the old ones didn't have it. Arguably, the HT is needed. But if they're doing a new version of this amp, they could have just added a rear panel fuse for the HT. There's plenty of room right here where the uh, ground switch traditionally would have been. So if, if you blow this fuse, you've got to spend a lot of money having a tech change out this inline fuse versus just changing it from the rear. That to me is uh, just a terrible, terrible point of design that introduces something that causes an expensive repair when you could have spent $4 for a fuse holder and save the owner a couple of hundred over the lifetime of the amp. There's nothing wrong with an HT fuse. Heater fuse, maybe they needed to do it to sell it in Europe, but again, an inline fuse covered in shrink wrap is just uh, an insult to the owner. And they have an artificial center tap right here, these two half watts going to ground off the heater supply. If you had a short, one or both of these would burn and cut off the heater supply. So these actually work as fuses which makes this doubly insulting in my opinion. They've got a 100 uh, microfarad, 100 volt uh, cap here. Nothing wrong with that. I believe that's 100 volt, yeah. Uh, diode, um, a suitable resistor. There's nothing wrong with the bias supply. Um, here we have some resistors with diodes across them. These are off the uh, cathodes of the output tubes going to ground here. 
It's an unnecessary thing. If you need to use these to buy a Synapse, you know, I, I don't think that they do much good. All they do is introduce a new point of failure. It's unlikely. The diodes probably will never be stressed out. It's fine. It's just a lot of excess wiring. And this entire amp is full of excess wiring. There's a lot of spaghetti throughout. Um, the heater wires are done exactly the same way you'd find on the 64, or sorry, the 65 and 68 reissues. Nothing special there. The amp is chock full of uh, lead-free solder, which makes work a little bit more difficult, but I understand why they have to do it. There's a smoothing cap here off the HT of the uh, uh, rectifier, which in theory helps filter out high frequencies better than the uh, 16 microfarad, actually 32 parallel reservoir cap can do by itself. Does no harm, it's fine. Let's see anything else in this area to point out. Sur same ceramic sockets used in the less expensive 65 and 68s. It's the same chassis as well. Might be drilled a little bit differently as far as how the board is mounted. I've not verified that, but you know, it is exactly the same quality of construction. The transformers seem to be the same as the much less expensive 64 and 68 as well. You can see they've got an additional 22 microfarad added uh, from the bias uh, supply, you know, the actual bias point to the shell of the pot. I do that in my own amps. It's a good way of further reducing hum in a fender. Uh, it's really crowded against this uh, intensity pot, but no big deal. It works just fine. Uh, they've got CTS pots throughout. I uh, will verify that the tapers are good later. It seems already to do to have the infamous CTS one meg thing where you, below nine o'clock there's just nothing. Then all of a sudden it's on. And here you can see these fake blue molded caps uh, to look cool on the gear page. I suppose they're supposed to be a callback to the old blue Ajax caps from the '60s. They're nothing like the blue Ajax caps. This is a standard cheap cap that is then covered in blue molded plastic and given a vintage looking label that says Mylar 10 wax. It's, it's, it's hogwash. Uh, a Mallory 150 would be, it might be a Mallory 150 underneath there. Um, you're paying a lot for cosmetics that few people will see. It's, it's a marketing thing. If one of these goes out, don't pay $8 plus whatever to get a replacement one that says Fender. Just use a suitable film cap. You use an orange drop, a Mallory 150M, a Sozo, a Vichy. It's it's silly. But, you know, it, if it's working, it does no harm. The board itself is fiberglass. And in parts, like over, I'll show you uh, by the reverb stuff and the fuse holder there, it is a PCB. In other parts, it has eyelets. Not real substantial eyelets, but actual eyelets. And it is wired uh, with to the eyelets with bits of wire rather than uh, printed circuit board traces. Um, to me, it makes it would make a lot of sense for this amp to have some more integration of circuit board traces so that it could avoid the spaghetti because this amp has a lot of spaghetti. The wiring in here is really substandard compared to what Fender did in the 60s. Uh, if you were doing this on the line in 1965, Randall Smith would fire you. And if Leo saw you, he'd have apoplexy. I guess it'd be a 64 for, for Leo. But, you know, this was just not, this is not done to the standard you would find in an old Fender, which, and, you know, they're selling 64. They're selling a, a certain quality uh, association, which the inside of the amp just does not provide. It's got the same stupid bit of cardboard here, keeping the, uh, no one from sticking their fingers or screwdrivers or any bits of metal through the jacks and getting zapped from something inside. It can, in fact, make the jacks not tighten all the way because that cardboard sits a little bit between the jack and the shell. So I will make sure that these jacks are tight. Some places they have the blue molded, aping what they did in, in the 60s. Uh, interestingly, the input cap for the phase for the phase inverter is another one of these blue molded. Uh, all, the originals would have had a ceramic disc there that does affect the sound. That should be a ceramic disc, one nanofarad. Here uh, they've got these uh, uh, IC film caps in the tremolo, that's fine. And here where Fender used a big red round uh, 100 nanofarad cap, they've done the same thing rather than using the blue plastic stuff. This is a DMT, this is a, a very good quality cap. If they'd used DMTs for everything in the, in the signal path, this would be a better sounding app. It wouldn't look blue and plastic and say Fender and have a vintage kind of a electrical sig signal on it, symbol on it, but it would actually sound better. You can see there's more spaghetti here. There's 
tons of spaghetti at the preamp wiring, uh, just stuff random, you know, just, I could probably get a couple of feet of excess wire out of here. Here, there's a fuse for the uh, uh, reverb driver transformer. So they fused the reverb driver transformer, and this part, you can see some traces on the board. This is a partial PCB in this area. I do find bad uh, reverb transformers in old, old amps, but it usually takes 50 plus years for that to happen. This is probably an unnecessary fuse unless they really have doubts as to the quality of the reverb driver transformer in these things. The uh, silver mic is here. This one's a, a CDE. That's a good one. The others just say SM. They're generic silver micas. And these are notorious for causing problems. Before I move down, I want to point out this cap here. This is the cathode bypass cap. It's shared for V4A and V4B. And if there's a problem with this cap, if it's not fully bypassing the stage, then you will get feedback within that stage because it that is mixing the wet and dry and then going to the next gain stage. So we'll be changing this cap out to get rid of that feedback in the in the uh, reverb. That's that's probably the culprit right there, nine times out of ten at least. Down here you can see the all the preamp grounds. This black wire here coming out of the doghouse are made to this jack which is fine if this jack is completely tight. We will make sure this jack is completely, completely tight. On the old 60s ones, this wire would have been going to chassis right about in this area, and it would have been going through the brass plate. And they've got grounds made to this uh, brass plate in a few places, some cathodes off the board, um, but they should have done this wire to here as well. Um, it's just a more reliable ground than trusting an input jack. Uh, when everything's working fine, that's fine. And similarly, like some of the 60s amps, I think they changed uh, sometime after 65. They've got the pot grounds made here uh, to the shell of the pot. Nothing wrong with that as long as all the pot connections are tight. I will verify that they are tight. I'll take all the knobs off and make sure all the pots are really tight. Uh, so all these grounds are good. And we had some noise on this volume pot I'll be verifying. It may just be it need to be cleaned, but I'll be checking for DC. More of a problem right here and right here. Like the 68 Custom, let me move some of the spaghetti out of the way. Like the 68 Custom, they are putting reverb and tremolo on both channels by joining the plates. So here's the plate of V2, sorry, V1B, and here is the plate of V2B. These are the recovery stages after the tone stack of each channel. And they have a plate resistor, 100K, and one here, 100K, from the same B-plus node. And in normal operation, there'd be a tube in each, in, each, in each slot, V1, V2. This one does not have one in V1. And this blends the signal at that point to just one signal. And it goes through this cap and then goes uh, fed through this 500 picofarad to the reverb driver stage, and there's a wire beneath the board from this junction right here to right here, and that uh, brings in the dry, and it's all mixed together over here. But the problem is that when you pull V1 like this, then this cap, sorry, this resistor is in parallel with this resistor, and this should be 100K, but because they're paralleled, 49.75K. And that means when you pull V1 in this app, instead of getting a gain increase because uh, V2 gets all of the 820 ohm cathode shared on, on the second stage of each tube, you're actually getting less gain because you are using a 50K resistor for the plate instead of 100K. So in other fenders, say the 68 Customs, I always revert it to either revert it fully to the actual AB763, which would have a cap here, and then the output of that cap is blended with the output of the Verado reverb channel down to the phase inverter input and takes away vibe trim from this channel. Or I uh, mix after the two caps. So I'd have a cap off here and a cap off here. And then I, that's the point where I join. So I'd be mixing AC signals rather than mixing DC signals. And then you won't have any problems with parallel caps or anything. And you can pull a tube and get all the benefits of having just V2. Uh, but this amp does not have an eyelet here or any other way for me to install a cap here. So I will talk to the owner, and if he wants to continue to use it without V1 present, then I need to disconnect this blue wire here from this uh, resistor, 
from this plate and just tape it off. And then this stage is just not used at all. And then this stage will have the full gain it's, it's, it's supposed to have, because this is going to be kind of anemic sounding as it is. That's a, a design flaw. I don't understand why Fender keeps doing the DC mixing on this and the 68 Custom. It is so much better and easier to do AC mixing. So you have this cap and you have this cap and you have two 220K resistors from those caps going to one point and that point would then feed the rest of the circuit. Uh, it's easily done. It can be done. Uh, I, I could do it to this amp uh, by disconnecting some wires and removing this cap and putting a terminal strip in uh, right in this area or maybe over here. Here would be better, but there's so much spaghetti because there's wiring. There's just so much excess wiring in this thing. You know, it sounds like I'm I'm being mean or, oh, God, he doesn't like anything. He's the amp curmudgeon, blah, 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 blah. If you market it as 64 hand-wired custom blah, 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 and tell us how great it is, and then it's not actually very good at all, and it's worse than many kit builds, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with Fender selling this to people who don't know any better, and all the channels out there telling you how great it sounds. And maybe if the amp you used before sounds even worse, you do think it's great. But compared to an actual 1964, 1965, 1966 Deluxe Reverb in good shape, this is a noisy beast. You heard the self-noise of this amp at the beginning with the volumes and reverb off. This amp should be silent at that point, and it is not yet. So I will talk to the owner, and I'll fix uh, this. And he may want to retain both channels with reverb and trim, and then I put in a terminal strip and, and do it right. Now, if, he, if he wants that, I'll do it, and I'll show everyone. Um, you know, I don't like to mod amps like this because I think... If amp costs this much and it's not up to snuff, sell it to someone who wants all the hoopla and spend that money on something better because there are a lot better sounding deluxe reverbs out there for the same price point. You can go to, um, oh, what's that brand that J.D. Simo and uh, Zach Childs like so much? I'll, I'll, I'll pop it on screen here. I'll look it up. Uh, Headstrong, Headstrong. You can go to Headstrong Amps if you're in the United States and get a much better deluxe reverb than this. It's just crazy. Anyway, let me change out this one cathode bypass cap. It's just a 22 microfarad. This one's a 35 volt. I've got 63 volts. It'll be a, a blue. I'm using a Vichy. Let me change that out, and then we'll hook up the reverb tank and see if that squeal is gone. Well, in this case, it was not, in fact, the cathode bypass cap. That's, where it, that's what it is in most vintage examples. In this case, it was this generic SM-labeled silver mica 10 picofarad going across this 3.3 mag resistor in the mixing stage. That's the culprit. And I think I've got one of those, a good quality ceramic on hand. And I'll talk to the owner, see if he wants me to replace all. This this 500 picofarad uh, CDE can stay, but these three, these are 220 picofarad uh, or 250. Uh, these are generic. These are not good things to have. They always cause problems down the road. Now would be a good time to change them out. And uh, you can see that I have disconnected this blue wire here from this plate that goes to this plate. It can be reconnected. I'm going to tape it off with some heat shrink and tuck it away because that's got live voltage on it. We want to have that uh, for someone to touch or for it to actually touch the metal shielding inside the uh, cabinet when it's all put back together. So I'll just tape that off. After talking to the owner, make sure he understands that by doing this, it makes this channel, uh, this channel sound really good but it totally disables the previous channel. There are other options to make this thing sound good, but again, how much do you want to do on an app that costs this much, that promises this much? So I'm going to tape this off and uh, talk to the, and replace this cap and talk to the owner about some things, but I also need to rewire the V3 driver socket. Just like in the 65 and 68, it's miswired from the factory. On 65s and 68 reissues, they'll have the plate and cathode crisscrossing the tube with a grid running in a loop around it. The actual way to do it for quietest, uh, least hum is to have the plate looping around and have the cathode and grid crisscross. So I've just got to cut this wire from plate to plate and run a new wire around in a loop. That'll decrease some of the reverb hum and buzz and noise issues.